Okay. Welcome everybody to the SOV board meeting. Uh, Holly, would you like to call the roll? Lou Ferris. Present. Steve Swan. Here. Bob Pulse. Here. Lois Henry. Here, but I can barely hear you. Rick Moran. Here. Was that better, Lois? Yes. Is that everybody? Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any additions and or deletions to the agenda? Chair, uh, staff has no additions or deletions to the agenda, not unless district council has any. Okay. At this time, we'll have uh, open it for oral communications from the public for any item that is not currently listed on the agenda. Three minutes. And you'll be limited to three minutes. <clears throat> Are there any? Chair Swanee, if I can just make a quick comment um, for folks who would like to participate uh, in uh, public communications, you can hit uh, uh, the raise your hand or hit uh, star nine to raise your hand if you're on a, a, a phone and we will call on you for questions. Someone has their hand raised, it looks like. Hi, it's Elaine. Hi. Hi, I just have a quick question about the committees and um, if you have any plans to restart them. Not at this time, we haven't discussed it. I think we're gonna wait and uh, see how things work out from the from the uh, government standpoint. See if the standards get relaxed as far as the uh, the virus crisis goes. Or we're waiting for, or we'll be accepting further instruction from our state representatives and government. I mean, could we do a Zoom a Zoom meeting? Yeah, I mean, uh, we can. Do, we can consider do that. that. Consider it, sure. Okay, that's it. Okay. We have a question from Jim Rosen. Okay, Jim, go ahead. I just wanted to follow up what Elaine said. I'm, I believe other organizations are doing committee meetings, so I, I think it is. I don't think there's a legal reason not to be doing your committees, and I think it would be really... Uh, important to get those going again. That's Thank all. you. Thank you. Any other comments? Doesn't look like no hands are raised. So we move over to unfinished uh, business. Rick? Yes, uh, item 5A is the Nakari property purchase uh, agreement and district council will deliver that item. Hey, Gina, item 5A, did you want to talk through that? Where's Gina? Gina, you're on mute, Gina. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, apologies for that delay. Um, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on this item because I think it was presented in a, a fairly uh, a fairly good level of detail a couple meetings back when the board was asked to consider some issues related to the negotiation 
of the property deal. Um, in your board packet, you can see that you have a copy of the final term sheet that was signed, um, the offering term sheet that, uh, that was provided by the district and signed by Mr. Nakari on March 10th. Um, the offer price that was agreed to uh, pursuant to the authority provided by the board was for a purchase price of $88,000. Um, there are a number of other terms and conditions set forth in the term sheet um, that are generally applicable to real estate deals and uh, governmental deals. And in particular, there's a number of obligations related to um, the anticipated construction of the swim tank replacement on the parcel. Um, all of that is set forth in the term sheet. Um, you will, you may have noticed that shortly before the meeting, um, I provided a draft form of the uh, agreement. This is a long form mm -hmm. agreement um, that the parties are going to enter into to formalize what's in the term sheet um, in a more standard uh, legal format. But it, it tracks the term sheet very closely. It's the same purchase price, $88,000. It's the same um, conditions for the construction that were set out in the, it's exactly the same con uh, uh, conditions for construction that were set out in the term sheet. Um, it does have some contingencies, including board approval, which we're gonna be requesting tonight. Also successful com completion of the CEQA process, which is important for any um, government uh, governmental uh, project in California. We've got to uh, make sure that the project is consistent with CEQA and pass a CEQA review before we uh, close the deal and pay the purchase price for the property. Um, so uh, what we're asking the board to do tonight is to approve the proposed resolution, which is exhibit B to uh, the board memo. And let me just get you the number of that resolution. It's resolution number 2019-20. Um, that resolution, if approved by the board, is going to authorize the district to proceed with acquiring the Nakari property. Um, it's gonna allow staff to finalize and execute um, the written agreement that I uh, emailed around just before the board meeting and to do everything else necessary for, purchase, for purposes of closing the transaction. And once again, the way this is written, the purchase price will not be paid until we actually receive the deed from Mr. Nakari and his family um, after CEQA is completed. So that's how uh, the closing is going to work. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, we recognize Bob. Hi, Gina, thanks. Um, uh, this is gonna be covered through uh, title insurance as well, regular uh, closing process. Yes, we'll get a preliminary title report and a title insurance commitment prior to closing this deal. Thank you. Any other directors with uh, comments or questions? No. Uh, throw it open to the uh, the public for any questions or comments as well. Seeing none, I think we're ready for a uh, motion at this All right. point. Um, yeah. Sorry, we have uh, questions uh, popping up like uh, moles over here. Okay, who was first? Rick, you were first. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, I'm in agreement with doing all this. And the one question I have, uh, Rick, is you had talked about having some uh, neighborhood meeting with uh, his neighborhood. And uh, I was wondering as a board member, uh, could I attend those meetings? Um, in the past, board members have has attended uh, such types of meetings. Um, as long as we have no Brown Act violations, I have no problem with it. I'd refer to Gina, um, if a board member would like to attend. Yeah, this is a good forum, forum to bring it up because as long as it's um, only one or two board members, it would be fine. Um, 
So if there are any other board members who want to participate, please speak now so that we can resolve it in this format. And I'll just add to it, Rick, that it, that's worked out well in the past that we've had, you know, individual board member attend a neighborhood meeting. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'd very much like to attend. And yes. I'll keep, I'll keep you in the loop. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next up on deck is Lois. You had a question? No, I thought we were done with questions. I have. Your something. hand is raised, Lois. I yeah. know it's raised. Now it's now it's down. Did you, want, did you I, want to make a motion, Lois? I wanted to make a motion that we oh, okay. accept resolution number 2019-20. I'd be pleased to second that. Okay. And let's turn it over to Holly to record the vote. Lou Let me, I, and I apologize, let me jump in for a moment, especially because this is a real property deal. I wanna make sure the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So if the motion could be amended uh, to approve the resolution uh, 20, 19 20, I'd appreciate it. It sounds like a minor issue, but it could be interpreted as being significant. Didn't I say 20, 19 20? Didn't and you I did, the uh, issue is that you said resolution. accepted Mm -hmm. Yeah, the issue is that you said accepted rather than approved, and I'm requesting oh, to amend oh, it oh, to okay. approve All right. resolution 2019-20. Yeah, approve. Okay. Terrific. Please proceed, Holly. Director Ferris. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Director Fultz. No. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Motion passes. Great. Perfect. And Swan, President Swan? Okay. Did that pop up well before we did stuff? Okay, let's, uh, who's got a question? Uh, Tina. Tina, please go ahead and. Uh... I was just curious. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I was curious if the board had considered other properties or if there was a reason um, you were buying this specific property just because of the location or had you considered the other options? Uh, we had considered, uh, well, I'll let Rick talk to you. We've, we've considered it. Other options, yes, this is the best option for the district from all of our studies and recommendations. Rick, would you care to expand on that? There wasn't a lot of parcels that met the criteria for the proper elevation and flatness that we needed that the tank would fit on. The topography on most of the area is very steep. And this parcel happens to be very flat for the area. and and more importantly, at the right uh, elevation for water pressure. Right. Thank you, Rick. Does that help answer your question, Tina? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Moving along to uh, the, oh God, item 5B, the draft fiscal year 21, 2021 budget review, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Rick, that was yours. That's okay. Um, item uh, 5B is uh, uh, the fiscal year budget 2021. We have the finance manager that will be giving this report. Hello. So everyone should have the memo kind of going over the background, the high level overview, and some of the key reports that are making it up. Um, this does have the full picture of capital, debt funding, kind of everything. Um, in pulling everything together and getting projections for where we think this year is going to end, there was a significant difference in what the fiscal year 1920 
budget for capital projects was planned to be versus what is actually coming in. Um, a lot of these are projects that are just getting kicked out um, into the next fiscal year. For example, the swim tank, which is now going to be called, I believe, the the redwood the redwood tank. Um, stuff like that gets kicked out. So our capital projects were budgeted at 7.8 million. We're expecting 4.6 in this year. It's making this fiscal year 2021 budget um, come in a little bit above 12 million. So that makes things look a little bit funny from that perspective. So this first, uh, the first set of numbers that you're seeing on the memo are the reserve balances and kind of how those are changing from the original budget being about 3 million, the projected reserve balance at the end of this fiscal year to be 4.1. And again, a lot of that's just simply due to the capital getting pushed out. So when we see fiscal year 2021, the projected reserve balance is going up to about 3 point, just a little bit shy of 3.8 million. Uh, the overview starts to go over some of the different operating expense increases. And then we'd have a bridge on the second page showing from when we presented the budget at the last board meeting um, for how the operating expenditures have, have changed for that. Then it gets into the pie charts that are showing the total uses of the funds and the total sources of the funds. So due to the high capital projects, it is showing that there is a decrease in the reserve balances um, to be able to fund all of those. Outside of that, a lot of the numbers remain the same for what we reviewed the last time. And so, um, you know, this is obviously a little bit less data being presented than what we're at the previous meeting. So if people want to dig into some of the details, we, I can always um, pull up some of the historic stuff from that. But for the most part, um, I can sit here and field some of the questions. We do have all of the related managers on the phone that can ha help answer some of the questions in their areas. Um, but overall, I mean, the reserve balances are going to be going up. Uh, it is projecting that we'll have our operating reserve balance fully funded, um, and we'll be starting to fund our capital reserve balance um, a little bit. Bob, you have a question? Comment? Yeah, but questions and comments. Um, Stephanie, as of last year, I believe our operating reserve balance was fully funded and the capital balance had just under a million dollars in it. Um, based on the budget you've put together, our operating margin is about $3 million. Unfortunately, the way the data is structured, it kind of mixes projects that you would take out of the 14.5 million, which really need to be the five um, projects that we were uh, said we were going to do. That's a little bit hard to see how that $3 million margin is going to be allocated. So could you uh, help me and, and everybody understand how that 3 million in uh, operating margin is being allocated? So the majority of it's going to fund the capital projects. Which capital projects? So if you go to the listing of all the capital projects, it tells you how those are being funded. And so it'll sit there and tell you which ones are the 14.5. So page, I don't know what the exact page is, but there's three columns. Um, the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in reserves. So there, there's a section that says capital improvement expenses and funding. So there's 12.1 in capital projects. There's 146,000 being funded by grants. And then there's 8.8 .8 being debt funded. So those are going to be, you know, that 8.8 .8 is going to be 
um, the projects that are related to the 14.5 million, then that leaves a balance of 3.2 million that the district is going to need to use um, the you know the operating income to be able, or in this case, also some reserves to be able to fully fund all of that 12.1 million. Well, look, and, and this is where I think a broader conversation really needs to be had. And we need to do this in conjunction with clarity around what all of our unfunded liabilities and underfunded liabilities are. Um, we have um, we have pension obligations, at least three and a half million, perhaps up as much as six million uh, or over six million, depending on what return on investment's going to be in the stock market, which I think we all know at least for this year, it's not going to be particularly good. Um, we have um, our capital uh, reserve fund. We have um, uh, requirements that we need to be spending probably at least three million a year for capital projects just going forward. Um, and we have meter replacement, and we have um, tank maintenance. And so I think what we need to do here is have a discussion with the information and all the numbers in front of us so we can decide how much money goes into each one of those pots. Right now, what you're presenting, it looks like, is a set of recommendations for where that money should go. And I think we need to have that broader, uh, the 3 million is going to go. And if the, I mean, this is up to the board, obviously, but I think we need to have a discussion about where we want to spend uh, our money. For example, I don't agree with the notion of putting in 2,000 meters in one year. What we do when we do that is we create this spike in um, that particular category which just leaves future boards with having to deal with an equivalent spike down the road. I think we need to have a uh, better analysis done of our meter situation here so we know whether or not doing 2,000 or roughly 25% in one year is the thing that a service business should be doing. Service businesses should be doing things level, flat, even, about the same every year. Uh, not creating spikes like that. Um, I think there might be some other places that we might want to put that money uh, in order to deal with some of the other liabilities that we have that may be equally critical. And so that's the invitation to the board to see if the board wants to have that kind of conversation about looking at all of our liabilities, getting everything on the table, um, understanding what all of our uh, uh, deferred maintenance liabilities are and figuring out where we want to go allocate these funds. Okay, any other board comment, questions about Bob's suggestion? Lois, what are your thoughts? Lois, go ahead. Okay, I put my paw up. Um, this is April. And pretty much Bob has been saying this for quite a long time. And I'm not sure we can get a definitive answer on all of those things. And I think it's important that meters are replaced. Uh, maybe we don't need to do 2,000. Maybe we could do 1,500. I don't know. But those new meters make a difference about loss of water. And people can track their water usage. They're great. And I, I don't know how we're going to get all the answers that Bob wants 
and get this budget done. I I just really don't know. That's all. Thanks, Lois. Um, any other? Um, Bob, you had a uh, response? Yeah, just a quick response to that. I mean, it's great that meters um, uh, do nice things, um, but what is the return on investment for the meters? Uh, or what are we getting out of that? Do we have any data about whether or not the meters that are out there um, really are substandard by substantial amounts, um, that which means uh, revenue loss, or are they only a couple of percentages off? Uh, if we replace this, how are these meters, how are we reducing our overall operating costs? Um, so I haven't heard any of the justification for that. Um, I think a meter replacement project of about 700 makes sense looking at the age of some of our meters, uh, some of which go back 30 to even 55 years, at least according to the data that I've seen. Um, but 2,000 meters, I think, is uh, way too much, particularly relative to where we are with our tank coatings. Um, so, yes, I have been saying this for quite some time. Um, it would be nice to be able to have these conversations earlier, but uh, these conversations still need to be had. Uh, and even if we don't do it this year, we're going to be doing it uh, going into June, July, August, September. So yeah. because these issues uh, just can't go away, we are facing an enormous amount of unfunded and underfunded um, uh, projects and uh, categories. And as of right now, as a board, we have not dealt with those in a comprehensive fashion. Right. Uh, let me uh, take a minute. Let me ask uh, Rick, that's your name. Let me ask the experts here that uh, actually run this business for an opinion on this, because it's not Stephanie's job to figure out how many meters to replace. I think she's basing that in the costs and such based on input she got from operations and, and uh, staff. So maybe you could comment, Rick, as to is 2,000 of an objective, a magic number, or is, a, is it an arbitrary stick in the ground or what? Or James, whoever can comment. Well, I, I think James is having some uh, some audio problems. The problem with our meters is that we do have a, a a good amount that have reached what in the industry is considered their accuracy liability. After 15 years, meters start slowing down. My concern is that we're losing revenue and we're showing an increase unaccounted for water because we're not metering that water. Um, we are behind on meter changeover. The only way we can tell you some of the information that Bob wants is as you pull these meters out of the ground, we send a percentage out to be tested, and they give back accuracy, and then you can accurately tell how much water is being lost. Some of that Some problem of that, is, I do believe it's about 50 bucks a meter to have them tested. It gets expensive. It gets expensive. You want you data want like that, data. you're going to have to pull a, a good percentage of meters, of meters and send them out for testing. Test. Up to this point, have we done that? Do we have a historical refer reference that tells us, uh, based on whatever percentage you've pulled and replaced this past year, for example? Well, the industry, the industry the will tell you 15 years, years that you shouldn't keep a meter in the ground over 15 ground. years. We're having, we're having like the meters in Felton meter. that are just going dead. Just going dead. Uh, we're finally we're caught up on uh, dead meter replacement. Meter but these are meters that are slowing down. down. These are meters that are going, going dead. dead. We do not we do estimate, not estimate any usage. So if a meter so goes, meter dead, goes dead, dead, that's lost revenue. Lost revenue. Sure. And so and we're, we're trying, trying to get caught up. And, and up. you know, I agree and with and Bob on the other hand that it is a mess. But it's also it's our cash register, and, and we're losing revenue. Of the meters that we've replaced that weren't dead, but were just simply aged, that have been sent out, have they come back with results that tell us, yeah, they were off we, by X percentage? We only sent one out, and it was off on the on the higher flows. 
It was an older meter. It was a, an, an inch and a half, two inch meter that was in a laundromat that was in the ground way uh, reached by a big tank. Uh, it was remarkably accurate on the low flow, but not at the high flow. Um, we do not send out to get tested just because of the cost. Now we could send out and have tested, but it is an expense. <clears throat> and the the target number of two thousand meters is that, that, uh, that gets how did we us up decide to, that? That gets, that gets us up to where our meters are we have a good accuracy and age. Our meters are we have a good accuracy and age of meters. And leaving yeah, us with uh, X number, X number to replace, right? X number. That's correct. X number. Okay, that's a good number. That's correct. Okay, let me, uh, uh, Lois, you had a comment again? I'll get to you next, Bob. Yes. Lois, go I, ahead. Um, having a little experience on another water board, I know that when meters get old, they don't record water usage like they should. Um, I also know that water meters have a life. And I believe our water meters and SLV are pretty much beyond their life expectancy. And to me, the meters, the new types of meters tell the public, our rate payers, so much about what they're doing. And if they have a leak, it, it, it's, it's fantastic what these new meters do. And can I prove a dollar amount that they save or create for us? No, but I happen to have a meter like that and I'm really happy that I do. And I think Lompico was one of the first areas to get this, these new meters. And I think they're a good thing for the district. And that in the long run, they'll save money for the district. That's it. Thank you, Lois. Uh, Bob? Yeah, there's there's no there's no argument here over the fact that new meters are better. The uh, discussion is over what the return on investment is and whether we're operating here and making allocations of capital based on numbers and uh, not guesses. So I think we replaced 500 meters last year. At least that was what I thought was in the budget or 400, something like that. Um, even if we had tested, you know, 20 of them, and I get that it costs money to do, though perhaps you can negotiate a deal if you say you're going to commit to testing X number, um, that would at least give us some information about whether or not these meters are in fact um, out of spec. We're operating at a significantly lower um, capacity uh, than what they should be. I mean, I look at other issues like tank coatings, where I don't believe we've done a lot of tank coating maintenance, at least according to uh, what James has indicated in the past. And I get really worried about tanks. Um, I also get worried about making sure that we can keep our promises on uh, the pensions that we um, uh, have committed to, and that it, we shouldn't be just kicking that can down the road either. Um, so this comes into how you want to allocate the capital, the three million in margin that we have, and putting um, uh, that much into one category, with, where we have really it sounds like zero uh, idea of what the return on investment is. I, I just don't think is the best thing for the district or the ratepayers or our employees. Are you suggesting any majors, Bob? Sorry, what was that? Are you suggesting that we replace zero meters? No, that's not what I, I mean, I said earlier, I think a number of about 700 uh, makes sense based on at least age. In lieu of any other data, we've got 700 meters according to the information that Rick provided that are 30 years and older. 
So, uh, I mean, I'm not sure why this hasn't come before previous boards or even our board beforehand if 700 meters are 30 years and older. But those to me, it seems like, would be candidates for uh, potential replacement. There may be other meters that are failing, as Rick was indicating in Felton, that might supersede that. But uh, doing 2,000 meters in one year and creating that kind of a spike um, in our deployment, where you're going to try to manage that 15 years down the road, I, I don't think that's a great thing for future boards to have to contend with either. Yeah, it, how was the number of 2,000 or arrived at, Rick? Through the age of our meters, district-wide. Okay. A 30-year-old meter is just, just, it's got to be losing revenue. revenue. And it also, and it increases, also increases our, our unaccounted our, our water laws that we have. We have for, I, I can understand, I can understand Bob's concern. concern. But that's, that's where we, we get our revenue. We get our revenue. A meter. A meter. Right. But we have zero data with which to make uh, any kind of concrete statement about how much we're losing. Well, it, it sounds like that's a historical and a and a and a and a norm that's within the industry, Bob. I don't think anybody's exactly. making any uh, unfounded allegations that. You know, meters don't go bad. I think they do, and I think Rick is basing that on the experience and the the industry uh, norms. I agree. Maybe two thousand is too many at one time. What's that? What's the cost for the two thousand? What's that number? It's five hundred a meter, about. It depends on how many meters they're going to be doing per day at the very back of the packet. It is the meter change out scenarios. Um, if 15 meters per day are being done, 2, 000, a 2,000 meter project would be 745,000. If it's 10 meters per day, that would be about 817,000. Um, with the higher volume, the only thing that I don't have factored in to the cost is um, the CalPERS pension. Um, it gets, it, it's relatively close. Um, if you look at 15 meters per day, it's 133 days. CalPERS would kick in at 125, but it's based off of a, a fiscal year. So for example, if the meter replacement program started in June and you know June is part of this fiscal year, July 1st starts the next fiscal year, you'd have to have 125 plus days in one fiscal year for when temporary employees would become CalPERS eligible. So 2,000 meters, roughly $800,000 is what we put in the budget. Okay. Uh, Lou, I see your hand up, uh, up and down like a, like a gopher looking for a snack. <laughs> When I first put my hand up, uh, you en end up asking the question, so I took it back down, but now I have an another comment, and that is that $12 million is a lot of money to spend in capital in one year. Bob's got a, a good point. We need to make sure that we are spending that on the right things. Um, most of those, that list of projects uh, are items that we've discussed in the engineering committee, and, and I wholeheartedly support as part of, of uh, taking care of our, of our um, uh, infrastructure backlog, but maybe the better question instead of continuing to talk about meters is what are we not going to do with that $12 million that we should consider doing and possibly replace something that is on the list? Does anybody have any comments on that? Mm, well, Rick's hand is up. Let's see if he's got an answer. Uh, well, I, I don't necessarily have an answer to that uh, question that Lou presented, um, but uh, I wanted to make a, a couple points. Is um, one, uh, the meters may be reading more, and they may be reading less. So their inaccuracy is can go in both directions. All right. 
Um, so we could be benefiting from some of that in, in one way. Um, but I uh, uh, kind of agree with Bob here in the sense that um, we should, you know, planned maintenance is planned maintenance. It should be, you know, kind of methodical at a nice even pace where you can, uh, you know, count on not trying to do everything at one step, but you're moving along, making progress as the things deteriorate, you're catching up. And so a, a slower planned uh, way is what planned maintenance is about, to my understanding. Um, the other thing is um, th there are some other issues, and this may be related to what Lou was talking about, but uh, Bob mentions tanks and pensions. So, um, you know, how do you divide that money up? And um, it, you know, we should consider uh, those other aspects of uh, need. That, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Bob, did you have another comment? I saw your hand up and down. <clears throat> Sorry, I, Rick was, uh, Rick uh, kindly filled in what I was going to say. Okay. I'm kind of the opinion right now, given the circumstances that uh, the economy's in, the country's in, and everything else. Uh, cash is king. And maybe if the economy was where it was uh, two months ago, and if we weren't facing some of the uh, challenges that we're currently facing here as well as globally, uh, maybe 2,000 meters is a little aggressive and a little more money. We should be a little more conservative with uh, cash. And uh, so maybe the number should be scaled back to some reasonable number, maybe cut in half or, uh, or at least discussed further. So that's sort of my thinking on it right now. I think maybe only because of the economic conditions that I would, uh, and the, the uncertainty that's out there, that maybe we should be a little more conservative with uh, with our cash. Bob? Well, I, I certainly think you're, you're right about the fact that the economy, I mean, we're in a recession right now and we'll, how long we stay in it, I think will depend on how long we stay in this lockdown. And, of course, the longer we're in the lockdown, the more um, serious damage we're going to do to the economy, too. So it's that trade-off there between the health of people and the health of the economy. Um, in that kind of environment, cash is definitely king. I agree with you on that. Yeah, I see. Uh, Stephanie, you had to want to make a comment? Um, so, I mean, there's nothing that puts the budget in, you know, sets it in stone. Um, you know, we could go from the 2,000 meters down to the 1,000. That would be, that would free up about $400,000. Um, ideally, what the Budget and Finance Committee would have been talking about in conjunction while this all is going on is we were going to be diving more into the CalPERS pension and ways that we can utilize paying down some of our unfunded liability, um, either there or the OPEB. Um, so there isn't anything restricting us from in three months from now, picking some of these conversations back up and allocating more of the district's reserve funds to go towards that. It's not uncommon to do an amendment to the budget directing, you know, a chunk of money, you know, like this $400,000 to be able to go to something um, once we're able to start having more of our committee meetings and have a more well-informed answer on some of these areas. Thank you. Rick? Uh, yes, when you said that, uh, Bob, I mean, uh, excuse me, Steve, about cash is king, and, uh, the uncertainty of the economic picture right now, uh, that's absolutely true. And I just wanna uh, totally reinforce that statement. So that's what I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments from uh, G? 
Gina, are you just clicking buttons, Gina? You got a question? <laughs> I You're would right. like to make a comment before we go out to um, public comments on this agenda item. So uh, right. I could do that now or I could wait. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know, in particular, the attendees that are on the phone, um, to please not use the webinar chat function um, to try to raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Um, if necessary, as a backup, you could indicate via chat to, to everyone, to all panelists and attendees, that you want to ask a question. But please just try to raise your hand and wait to be called on. Um, the chat isn't a good way to do that. We definitely don't want to have private chats going on in the background. Um, we've asked members of the board not to chat with each other. We'd ask you not to try to chat with the panelists or the members of the board. And if there are any, we'll try to read them in the record because um, all those communications should be a matter of public record for purposes of the meeting. So um, apologies for that public service announcement, and uh, <laughs> I Gina. will go back to me. Very good, Gina. Gina, Gina for, those people yeah. that came in, for those people that came in late, because I see we have 15 attendees now, how do you raise your hand on a telephone, if you're on a telephone? Um, I will defer to the folks from Community TV to explain that function. Nine, you will raise your hand. Sorry, I didn't, I couldn't hear that. Star nine, star Sorry. nine will raise your hand on a phone. Thank you, Rick. Okay, any other uh, directors or staff with comments before we open it up to the public for input? Okay, we'll open it up to uh, the public for any comment. No, you don't see any. Oh, there's one, two. Okay. Uh, okay, so that we got Elaine. Go ahead, Elaine. Uh, First on my list. Okay, I'm on now, right? Yes, I, I just want to make a comment about the meters. Um, is, if you have, a, as I did, a rental that had a bad leak and didn't know about it until the uh, bill was over $500, it's really nice to have a new meter uh, just to know about that. And as in terms of revenue, I don't know if it's possible, but I would be willing to chip in to replace my meter. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but it could be a source of revenue for you folks. Okay, thank you for your input. I don't know how that would work, but uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a hat in front of the uh, water department. <laughs> Feel free to drop in a donation. No, I don't know. We'll, uh, I don't know. We'll, uh, I'll ask and see if there's something that we, we can consider discussing that and see what happens. Uh, thank you. Uh, E.J. Armstrong, your hand is up. You're recognized. Hello. Go ahead. Can, you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. There we are. Yes. yes uh, Commenting on the meters, uh, one thing uh, to avoid is a pig in the python in which you uh, uh, put a lot of costs going forward in terms of meter replacement. Another strategy is use primary meters. Secondary, use a neural network of meters, and that way you can use uh, mathematics, statistical mathematics, to determine what your uh, loss rate is on any of the meters in terms of failure as well to be able to identify that mathematically you don't need to do it specifically meter by meter uh, i think that would be a, a low cost advantage new things are really great but you know down the line new things also have to be maintained and replaced and so you push you're just basically spending money today to push the problem out into the future 
it might be possible to identify the weak points in the system early on and, and just deal with those specifically, uh, you know, case by case from that point of view. That's my comment. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Well, with that uh, concept, right? Yeah. Well, the data that from all meter manufacturers from the testing of the meters in their act. 15 years is the magic number that they recommend replacement. Most all agencies replace in 15 years. Some will replace it even sooner for the larger flows. You know, for right. four inch and six inch meters, which we don't have. For, for um, um, so, let's see, no, no, Holly made me comment. Um, our, the meters run slow, they don't run fast, they wear. Um, there's the chamber inside the meter is and as it spins, it wears over the years. Yeah, very seldom, very seldom ever, ever, especially with especially the magnetic drive, ever re -hot. There's, there's a loss of revenue. How much? It just depends. And uh, when they go dead, we even lose more revenue. And that's the reason I'm you know, pushing for a meter to get the meters up to, to what I would consider the accuracy. You know, we need revenue. Right. That's our, that's that's our first. first. We don't get a revenue sale of water. water. We're not going to have money to do anything. anything. Right. Yep. So, so, you know, it's up to the board. If you want to cut the amount of meters back, but it's also going to show a larger unaccounted for water. We're not going to be able to account for water. And when we apply to the state or when we um, provide our information to the state about our water loss. It looks, it looks horrible, horrible and they're, they're they have they concerns. Have concerns. We're, we're losing 30 percent of our water and not being able to account for. Are they subsidizing any of this meter replacement? No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay thank you. Uh, okay, so back. Oh, Bob, I see your hands up again. Yeah, uh, just a number of points. First of all. Um, if we could, uh, I would like to advocate that the board um, uh, ask the district manager to test uh, a to be determined number of meters that are being replaced over the course of this next year to be able to, uh, so we can derive some information about what our return on investment may be uh, for these kinds of things. If we are doing testing now, um, we definitely need to do some going forward. It doesn't have to be an enormous number. I think, uh, you know, looking at uh, a, a statistical sampling would, would probably be sufficient. Uh, the second thing regarding um, uh, water uh, not being uh, billed for, um, I think one way to start getting an idea of that is if we start running a report and seeing meters that are consistently at zero, um, meters then we or zero units then over a period of time not just a month or two but over a, a period of time i think we'll be able to get a sense of whether or not we have a lot of meters that are um uh you know going bad and third um you know a lot of our uh, water loss situation is due to uh, leaks as well i mean the system itself the pipes um and at least some of the tanks, uh, you know, are also quite old. And this is something that the boards in the past have not wrestled with. We're going to have to wrestle with that and figure out how we're going to address that. I don't think 100% of the water loss is due to um, bad meters, but hopefully by statistically sampling that, we'll be able to get a better idea of that going forward. With respect to uh, selling meters, um, I've talked uh, in the past about uh, the fact that we should be uh, making kind of an option available to customers if they wish to uh, purchase uh, those kind of electronic meters in advance of when they would be otherwise eligible to get them. We have 8,000 roughly meters in our system. We're not going to be able to do all 8,000 uh, overnight. 
uh, and perhaps some people may wish to uh, to do that. Uh, and I, I agree with Elaine. I think that would be a good uh, source of income for the district. Thank you. Thanks. Is, uh, are, are they available to be? Yes, they are available. To be purchased? Yes. Okay. And of the, of the 7,900 connections that we have roughly, and you replaced 400 last year, how many were replaced? How many are yet to be replaced? I'd have to look. I, I can tell you, I have the spreadsheet up. Uh, there's uh, 20 to 94 meters that are 15 years or older. Um, there's 500 that are 15 years. There was a big push about 13, 14 years ago. There's 2,200 that are 13 and 14 years old. So basically, if you look at 12 years and older, that accounts for, uh, shoot, yeah. My spreadsheet just uh, choked on me there. That's going to count for somewhere around four to 5,000 meters that are uh, 12 years or older. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue, but it's one that has, of course, been building up for quite some time. Right. Stephanie, you have a comment? I just wanted to address the the comment about zero usage the district already does do that when we see accounts that had usage um, showing up with zero usage um, we do go out and investigate if it is a dead meter or not if it is a dead meter those do get replaced you know outside of any you know meter replacement program um, so that is something that staff identifies on a regular basis well, so if I got one then a dead meter that's all right. Here. By the way, Steve, the, 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 number, the number is 5,000 for that are 12 years and older out of our 8,000. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So, I, I, Gina, you had a. Yes, uh, President Swan, I just wanted to suggest um, going out to the public one more time to close out public oral communications on this item. I saw one uh, hand go up from the public and then go back down. And I'm, uh, I, I just want to make sure that we get any last public comments and then close it out. Okay, sure. Um, any, uh, anybody from the public have a comment they'd like to uh, make? We'll give you a second shot at it. Okay, I don't see any hands. I do see a thing saying my internet connection is unstable, but that's surprising. Okay, so I guess uh, no more public comment. Uh, so I think we kind of beat this up. I'd like to suggest to, to the board, maybe that we, we do cut the number of meters anticipated in half and, uh, and take Stephanie's suggestion that in a couple of, uh, couple, three months, we take a look at what to do with the extra $400,000 and allocating it to those areas, uh, uh, whether it's pension or whatever other areas we could possibly use it in and see how the economy is going at that point in time. Uh, that's my suggestion. Uh, I think it's a good one, Steve. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll also agree with that, Steve. Thank you. So that's the suggestion. Right? There's nothing to move on, no motions or anything, right? Yes. Okay, next up. Mr. Uh, General Manager. <coughs> It's item 5C, um, it's uh, correspondence to PG&E regarding uh, PG&E's wildfire mitigation plan and tree removal. I do believe that the environmental planner is on at the attending the meeting tonight and she will give you this item. Carly? Sorry about that, can you hear me now? Yes. 
Okay, great. So um, I believe at the last board meeting, we had Nancy Macy come in um, and recommend that the board write a letter to pg and &E concerning their wildfire <laughs> management plan um, that they're putting together. So we redrafted the letter, me and Nancy and Rick Moran and Rick Rogers um, went through the draft and approved it. So we're hoping this will be the final letter that we'll send out to pg and &E. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, let's get the director's comments. We've got uh, first up, Lou. Thanks, Steve. Um, looking at the letter, I have no problem with the first three paragraphs. I think that presents our position very well in terms of alternative uh, pathways besides just cutting down trees. I am a little concerned with one sentence in the fourth paragraph. It's the one, it's the uh, second sentence with that says, this should mean focusing on replacing the 7,100 miles of infrastructure that they have committed to upgrade over the past, over the next 10 years, which seems impossible at the current proposed rate of 240 miles per year. And I just, it just wonders, it, it, that doesn't seem to fit into the whole discussion of um, whether or not we cut down trees or replace infrastructure um, on our land or even in the valley for that matter. I, I just don't think that belongs in the letter uh, because it, it's talking about the state of California and not the San Lorenzo Valley. And all we can represent and speak to is the San Lorenzo Valley and the water district. I see your point. It's a little, uh, it's kind of a little backhanded snide swipe at uh, PG&E. Uh, Bob, you have a comment? Yes, uh, first of all, I wanted to clarify for uh, for the public. I, I think on the agenda it stated that the board at the last meet, uh, at the meeting of March 5th uh, directed uh, staff to work with um, Nancy Macy. I, the, the minutes actually reflect that we were going to send the this letter to the environmental committee. I don't know if that took place or not, but um, I think what was really meant by the agenda is that because the committee meetings were canceled and because it was clear the board wanted to move this along, uh, staff went ahead and undertook a, uh, a rewrite of this. So just a clarification for everybody on that. Uh, the second part I want to mention is um, I, I actually have a very different um, suggestion here for this letter in terms of the manner in which we're approaching this. Um, you know, in, in the sales world, when you're trying to um, convince people to uh, enter into something that would benefit you, I think it's a really good approach to talk about how uh, the interests align, where we can get a win-win out of this, and ultimately, I think the district's interest in this is as follows. Um, we definitely want to have them harden the power lines that go over our property so that our property isn't uh, subject to as much wildfire danger. We definitely do not want them to um, <clears throat> move down a path of clear cutting to the point where it's bare ground or not much vegetation, which will increase the erosion uh, potential and have other severe effects downstream, we definitely would like them to prioritize the kinds of areas that uh, our uh, property is, uh, sensitive uh, environmental areas, and certainly accelerate the overall program. I don't know that we necessarily want to be instructing uh, a power company on how or the technologies or the methods by which they would harden their facilities, technologies change at a very rapid pace. And I think uh, we as a water district are not as uh, expert in that, just as I probably wouldn't like it if PG&E came to us and said we should be using chemical X in our water treatment versus what we are doing. Um, so I actually have a different letter that I'd like to share with the board. Uh, and uh, Gina, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, I can share through the um, Zoom web conferencing. Unfortunately, the attendees won't be able to see it unless they're on that web conferencing, uh, but everybody else would. 
is that going to be okay with the with the Brown Act, or are we uh, sort of operating outside of that at this point? Well, um, okay. it forces us to improvise a little bit. Usually, what we would do is have hard copies available in the meeting room. Um, but for this circumstance, I think what we could do is um, you could share your screen for those who could see it, and then if a member of the public um, wants to get a copy during the public comment uh, period, they could I, I can uh, the, ask us to e email one. Yeah, I can email if they put their email address in the uh, chat, I can email it to everybody that wants one. It, it might take me a while to cut and paste it, but I can certainly do that. Yeah, and of course, folks may want not want to do that. So another way to do it is, um, Holly, if you have an email uh, account up, somebody could send, you could give your email address and somebody could email you and request it if you have a copy. I do not have a copy. Yeah, I, I, this was something that was just put together. And because of the fact that we're dealing with this differently, I wasn't exactly sure how to, uh, how to handle this. Uh, so. Can, you, can we put it up and uh, and have it, and you can read it to us and the 15 attendees that are uh, participating? Uh, yes. It's not a longer letter, is it, Bob? It's, um, it, it's about a page. Um, and by the way, this was also addressed to PG&E. The, the sort of the requests that are being made in here are, request to PG&E. If we are writing a letter to the governor, I think we would want to have a more expansive discussion about how the PG&E public safety power shutoffs are affecting this at a financial level, operational level, public safety, that sort of thing. And, and it would be, I think, a, uh, I think a lot of the topics would be the same, um, but I think we would also want to include other impacts so that the governor would be aware of you know how much this is affecting the uh, public, both environmentally as well as uh, uh, convenience and cost. Uh, you know how much it's costing the district to do that. I am sharing the letter now. Can yeah, everybody can, see the share? Yeah, I can see yes, it. Why sir. don't you go ahead and read it and go down because we've got uh, Nancy uh, as an attendee and and of course the two directors that worked with her on this and Carly is here as well. She can see it, I'm sure. So. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. The San Lorenzo Valley Water District supplies drinking water to 7,500 customers in the San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley communities. About half of our drinking water is obtained from surface water tributaries and springs that empty into the San Lorenzo River. These surface water sources are located on approximately 1,300 acres of critical biodiverse watershed property on Ben Lomond Mountain, which the district has protected for decades to ensure high quality, um, high water quality and minimal environmental impacts. We recognize that PG&E has a vital interest in maintaining the power lines across district property from Boulder Creek to Empire Grade. Over the past several years, district staff have collaborated with PG&E's contractors regarding vegetation and tree removal activities on district property in particular, the hardware trees that have a greater potential than redwood trees to fall and damage power lines. The district understands the state of California's concerns regarding increased wildfire risk and the need for public safety. While our district is committed to its collaboration with PG&E, we want to make it clear that we do not support a process that ultimately results in a zero vegetation situation across district property. We believe this could trigger a cascading effect, even if unintentional, that will a significantly increase the potential of greater erosion, which B has a high potential to significantly impact our district's water collection and treatment facilities at a high cost to our customers. For example, if turbidity levels due to increased erosion exceed 30, and Carly, uh, you know, forgive me for butchering this, nephilometric turbidity units and which C could cause significant damage to downstream fish habitat in the San Lorenzo River, habitat that is finally seeing the beginnings of steelhead and co salmon rejuvenation after years of effort on the part of many stakeholders. Ultimately, we do not believe such outcomes are in anyone's best interests. 
Our district supports PGD's consideration of taking a different approach using current and future power industry best practices and technologies. We urgently request PG&E prioritize its hardening, uh, hardening its power infrastructure in environmentally sensitive areas like the districts. We believe that accelerated overall upgrades to PG&E's infrastructure will help avoid PSP shutoffs, which also affect water delivery. And we request that PG&E and its contractors continue to collaborate with district staff prior to tree removal activities on this sensitive property. We believe that this approach will result in better outcomes for the environment, will enhance public protection against wildfires, and will minimize impacts to district facilities. Thank you for continuing to work with our district on this vital public policy issue. Great. Okay, thanks for uh, reading that, Bob. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I will stop sharing now. Okay. Lou and Rick, uh, you guys worked with Nancy on this, or Carly rather. Uh, you guys read that or heard that, read it, and uh, any comments? I'll let Lou go first here, if you want to, Lou. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I like it. Uh, I think it essentially covers the same major points that uh, Carly's letter does. Uh, but it does it in, in a more collaborative way. Um, I, I could go with either one as long as we take that one sentence out of the, the one that's in the packet. Right, okay. Thanks, Rick. Okay, um, yes. So uh, I uh, worked with Carly um, in uh, making some recommendations to this letter and um, you know, uh, Bob has done uh, another addition to this and uh, made some good points. So, and made some good deletions as well. And I think Lou speaks to that as well. Uh, so um, one thing I've uh, heard from my experience in working with the water district is not to be so specific and to uh, try and be uh, more, is particularly when dealing with uh, issues like this, is be more general so you don't lock yourself into uh, specific kinds of remedies. Um, so I agree with Bob and being uh, calling for best practices rather than uh, specific recommendations about how to change the wires or do, uh, you know recommendations about that. So um, it speaks to the same issue about. Uh, protecting the habitat for uh, the river and the fish and dealing with erosion and dealing with uh, the number of trees that are uh, being uh, cut down um, or trimmed. Uh, so I uh, think Bob's letter uh, has made uh, some uh, progress in uh, being more collaborative. That's the word that I'm hearing uh, from everybody. And I think it is that, so uh, I appreciate that. And I would support uh, Bob's letter. Um, I would support Bob's letter. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> any other uh, any other board persons have a comment on this? Lois? I think Bob's is a good letter. I think they're both good letters. Um, so we could. So you don't have a dog in this fight, right? I, you know, I, I think Bob's is good. But, yeah. uh, I, think and good. I thought the original one was good too. So yeah. I appreciate That's Bob's good. effort on that. Right. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, Carly, as staff, do you have any uh, comment on this? Did we, does Bob's letter miss the point somewhere from your perspective, or what are your thoughts? No, I, I do think um, I agree with everyone saying that Bob's letter is much more collaborative, and I think that is a good approach um, compared to the original letter that is maybe a little more um, of a pointing a finger. Um, I think this one does have a little bit more of a collaborative feel. Um, that is a nice approach. Thank you. Uh, any uh, comments from the public? I know, Nancy, you're on the line, or at least were. 
Yes, let's recognize Tina first. You were first up, Tina. Thank you. Um, I, I like points in both the letters. I think that uh, I do agree that Bob's letter is a little more collaborative, but I also think that there's some good points in the original letter that uh, leave out more specific things that are maybe happening that perhaps um, if you're at a distance and you don't live in the valley, you don't understand like the difference between hardwood and redwood and how the trees differ or how the erosion happens or, you know, maybe there's something that's more scientific that maybe someone reading this who isn't a scientist would miss. So I think it might be a good idea to take both letters and um, and sort of like look over them in a sense and, and, and make a, a new letter that's both collaborative and also hits on the, the scientific points of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nancy, you're next up. Nancy, you're on mute. Uh, is this better? Yes. Okay, sorry. I didn't know I was muted. <laughs> um, congratulations on making this work, you guys. This is great. Um, th and thank you for addressing the letter and Bob for your time and energy in writing a new letter. Um, uh, the <laughs> Personally, the the letter is meant to be critical because PG&E has failed to upgrade the system in the San Lorenzo Valley for 60 years in some areas. And we have ample evidence of that where all the single wire, uh, single um, six gauge copper wire, which their own Office of Public Advocates stated uh, was antiquated and uh, unsafe. So, um, you know, definitely, some of that language is in there for that reason. But um, I totally agree that the letter you need, um, and, but you've got to have the right in there because um, Bob was using the other letter and since then there's been, there have been, there's a new CEO since uh, Geisha was in there. And um, so we'll have to update that information. Um, I would implore you, however, to CC the letter to the new wildfire safety division of the CPUC. It turns out that the uh, legislature, legislature in their wisdom decided to create a new division in the California Public Utilities. Uh, and, and it is called the Wildfire Safety Division. And their first job is to approve or disapprove or request changes in PG&E wildfire mitigation plan. And um, so they should get a copy of this letter because right now the plan spends over $680 million on cutting down trees, including trees that are up to 200 feet from their right of way. Um, and I don't want to go into details about that, but CAL FIRE is involved and their pg &E is already getting uh, notices of violation because they're not following the, the timber harvest uh, regulations. But um, uh, so I think they need to hear how our water district feels uh, that they're concerned that the removing of the trees is, is uh, potentially detrimental, especially when they are healthy, mature trees. Um, not, you know, do you want to take out the ones that are brushing up against the wires? You want to, you know, maintain the distance from the wires, obviously. Um, and you definitely want to get rid of the dead ones that are going to fall on the wires or the ones that are, that are you know, so weak and, and feeble that they might. Um, and, um, you know, there's criticism on how PG&E determines that or how their contractors determine it. Uh, but, um, you know, they shouldn't be cutting down happy, health, happy, <laughs> I wish, healthy and mature trees. Um, but anyway, so if, if you would CC the wildfire safety division and also the chair uh, or the president of the Public Utilities Commission, Mary Bell Batcher, 
um, who is very involved in this whole process and uh, is eager to hear from people like the water districts. Um, she, she holds that information in high regard. So um, please let's please do address it to PG&E to the CEO, and um, we'll, we can update. Um, I'd be happy to help Harley update that information, um, and then CC the Wildfire Safety Division of the CPUC, and um, and also uh, the chair, Mary Bell Batcher of the CPUC. So um, and go ahead, throw the governor in too, because he has been very hands-on in this entire process and would be interested as well. Um, so um, you know, I I see I don't have any problem with getting rid of the 700 and 7,100 miles of infrastructure. Uh, but I want to make one point that, um, um, Bob, I think your letter is beautiful. I support it all the way. There's not a problem with it except one major thing. And that is in your focus to on the water district pro uh, property, you're missing um, an important point. And that is it isn't just water district property that is affected by what the dis what PG e is doing. And because of the high utility associated wildfire danger in our district, the importance of upgrading the system uh, throughout the San Rosa Valley, in fact, throughout the, the um, mountains, but you know, the whole coastal watershed uh, or the whole coastal um, mountain range, uh, the Santa Cruz coastal mountains. Um, but it, definitely in our water district, in our watershed, um, if because if there's a fire up Bear Creek Road, even if you don't have property directly affected, uh, that wildfire will will affect the district. So um, that was one of the good points I thought you made when you did your original uh, presentation was uh, with regards to the other properties as well, Nancy. That was. Yeah, so that's my the only thing I have though that's a real a real problem in Bob's letter. Everything else is beautifully written. Um, everything else is 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 fine, but you need to somehow add back some language that says we're concerned about our entire uh, San Lorenzo River watershed, um, not just uh, um, you know not just our water district property. Um, right. So. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to express my concerns. Yeah, uh, so I, I'm assuming uh, that's really good, very good feedback, and especially the copying all of the additional parties that you mentioned. Uh, I'm assuming, Bob, you wouldn't mind updating or working with uh, Carly and uh, maybe perhaps Nancy to take some of their suggestions and work them into your finely crafted uh, prose. Uh, that's why I raised my hand. Uh, I thought that would be a uh, uh, a good thing as a, as a next step, and I'd be happy to email that out um, here right away. Great. Uh, I've got a couple more comments from the public here. So let's see, uh, EJ, uh, you had uh, something you wanted to mention? Uh, yes, I'd just like to mention that in my experience, it's the subcontractors who are doing all the work. They're the ones who are actually in the field. Sometimes they're two or three levels removed, uh, and they will do whatever they think that they should be doing, depending on, and who knows. And I've spoken with a lot of them, and some of them are very conscientious, and other ones are just trying to get through the day. I would recommend including in the letter something regarding the subcontractors and having a representative of the water district with, working with those specific subcontractors every step of the way. And I would also remind you that in terms of specifications, it's all about copy and paste, and it's under the master specification index. And so having something in the letter regarding that, that they could actually copy and paste for the subcontractors could be very valuable. Sure. Having dealt with a lot of subcontractors over the years and knowing what they can and cannot doing, doing what power they, they, they have when they're in the field. 
And they really do have a lot of power when they're actually in the field, much more so than we think. That's my Thank comment. You. Thank you for your feedback. Dina, you had another uh, comment? You only get the one shot at this, you know. I'm giving, making an exception. No, no, thank you. I'm sorry, I must, must have been a mistake. Okay, thank you. Okay, back to the board then. So I guess uh, uh, our direction from this standpoint would be, Bob, you've crafted a wonderful letter and uh, if you will get together with Carly and take the additional input from Nancy and make sure we get the people who are currently in power and uh, make whatever minor edits are being suggested. We're good to go and I'll be happy to stamp it with uh, with uh, my name. So thank you all very much. Moving that takes care of our unfinished business. Moving on to new business, Mr. Director. Hey, it's uh, item 6A would be um, uh, the temporary utility billing policy. It changes in response to COVID-19, um, the Director of Finance will, will give this report. Uh, Stephanie? Okay, so the district did start moving forward with suspending, um, you know, the past due process with regards to the penalties and turnoffs. Um, however, there is still more measures that could be taken. Um, so this memo is to identify one, the actions the district has already taken in response, um, and two, requesting direction for some of the other measures that could be taken. Uh, the recommendation from staff was to temporarily suspend reporting past due accounts to credit reporting agencies delay efforts to initiate collecting past due balances via the property tax roll. We had originally intended, uh, we would have already been in the process of this uh, coming up here shortly in 2020, um, postponing this until uh, possibly next year. Um, but ho uh, however, continue to use liens to secure debt owed to the district. Um, so those, that's the recommendation for the actions that we're looking for. If we wanna go to the background, the district has already taken the following actions uh, in response to the past due policies. We've suspended all late fees. We've suspended physical past due tags and turnoffs. We've suspended all outgoing past due notifications other than the standard blurb that shows up on a past due bill. Um, and we sent a notification letter out to the property owners reminding them that um, they are still respo ultimately responsible for tenant account balances. Normally they'd get a notice when a tenant is being turned off, but since we've delayed the shut off process, we wanted to proactively contact the owners. Um, and then number two starts to go over the following remaining past due policies that kind of goes with the logic of our recommendation above. Um, if we were to, so A refers to temporarily suspend reporting past dues to credit agencies. If we were to continue doing this, it would negatively impact a person's credit rating. Um, the property tax roll, that is just a different form of collection that the district has not fully utilized in the past. And then liens, liens don't, Liens wouldn't impact someone's credit. A lien would be a way of securing the debt owed to the district and become enforceable um, upon like a real estate transaction of, of that home changing hands. Um, and then it kind of goes over kind of what some of our current past due balances are. Um, and so I can kind of field any questions that people have. We kind of laid out multiple alternatives that the board could take as well. Okay, do you wanna go over those or I assume the board has reviewed this and the public has and are familiar with the alternatives? Essentially it's... I'm sorry, go ahead, Stephanie. I would say the alternatives are essentially uh, do all of them, do none of them, or the board can you know pick some combination of. 
question. Um, Rick, you're first up. I'm mute, okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, Stephanie, I, I want to really thank you for, uh, and Rick as well, uh, all the staff, for uh, being so responsive and sensitive to the new financial environment. Um, I think it's a great effort you guys have made. Um, one of the uh, things I read in there is that the old message uh, that's on, uh, that's a uh, kind of like an automatic message for past due uh, was a little out of date. Is is that something you could uh, change without too much trouble? Uh, well, Ste I mean, the, it, yeah. So the the past the district the staff was directed to send out the past due notifications for the the month of March. Um, this is third party pre recorded stuff that is not, you can't just pivot on, you, you can't pivot quite frankly yeah. easily. Um, I mean, it took us about two months to get it rewritten for the SB 998, you know, type okay. of stuff. Let alone, you know, I mean, you know, the question did get brought up, you know, well, can we pay them extra to expedite it? Well, I mean, they're just absolutely inundated. So the short answer is is no. Um, so that's why the district chose to stop send, you know, to stop the past due reminders. Even okay. um, the only spot that it really shows up is on the bill, um, and it is a much softer mess. You know, if you are past due, a blurb pops up on the bottom of your bill, letting you know that you still have a past due balance. Um, so that still is on there. That's very common for um, a lot of the other places we were looking at. You know, the, you don't want to ignore the fact, you know, necessarily ignore a hundred percent the fact that you know it is a past due balance. You know, because calling it out as a past due balance is still important to a certain regard. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for answering that. Well, I, I support uh, the staff recommendation for sure, and I applaud. Uh, the actions you've already uh, done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lois. Oh, Lois, I think you're on mute. By the way, Rick, just to get clear, you you were supporting the staff recommendation. There were. There were two, oh. three alternatives. Was there one of the three? Okay. Hang, hang on, just a quick question back to Rick. Rick, were you supporting alternative one, two, or three? Well, um, I, I think all, all of the measures that they're currently doing to continue doing those is where I was at, I think. Okay, so that's alternative two. Okay. If, if, I don't have that piece of paper in front of me, uh, but uh, I'll take your word for it, Steve. Yeah. I could chime uh, uh, in. The staff had a recommendation. There then yeah. were alternatives. Right. So the recommendation is to temporarily suspend oh, uh, reporting to credit agencies, delay the collecting via the property tax roll until 2021, and continue to use liens as the main way to secure debt owed to the district. I agree with those recommendations. If that answers your question, Steve. Uh, Lois, back to you. You had a comment. Sorry to have interrupted your time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think waiting to do property tax until December 20. T1, 2021, when liens actually do affect people's credit ratings, what happens with the property tax is, okay, it would start December of this year, and the county teeters it. If the person doesn't pay their tax bill, the county gives the district their money anyway. Uh, and 
then the county is going to do whatever they're going to do to try to collect the tax bill. Um, but I found that putting property on the tax bill, uh, and putting the, the bill on the property tax bill really does a great job of collecting the money and you start getting it right away. The person might not be paying it right away because the county's gonna pay it to the district even if they don't. Um, the only time I've known the county not to pay if something's on the property tax is if it was a huge bill that they owed thousands and thousands of dollars, maybe more than their property is worth, then I don't think the county would would uh, tear it. In fact, they'd probably be going after that property. Um, I so I I disagree. I think property tax is the way to go. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, Bob. Yes, um, Stephanie. Uh, do we have any uh, liens? currently expiring that is right in, in the next year are we going to lose any money by maintaining uh any of the liens and not converting them to property tax uh correct i mean the district we it's a it's a monthly task of us going through and releasing any of them that are set to expire so we do have ones that would be expiring um our process is to release them currently oh, okay. Uh, okay. yeah so just to be Clear. Uh, I agree with Lois uh, on the property. Hang on a Go ahead. Uh -huh. hang on a yep. I'm not quite done yet. So um, the uh, the other comment that I had is that we can at some point in the future. A question: We can at any point in the future move something from a lien to a property tax. Is that correct? Gina might know Gina might know more on that one. I mean, I know we could send stuff to the county, but as far as when they actually secure it against the property and it going into the property tax rule, I don't know that aspect that well. Well, but I mean, it's a, it to be the same thing as the past due balances you're sending, right? It's just we're basically we're we're going to remove the lien and we're going to send it to the County, just like we would for the past due uh, bills on item B. Is that not possible? There is a much longer process for posting notices, holding a public meeting to where the property owners can be heard and contest to the board, putting it onto the property tax roll. I don't know um, the county's exact procedures. You know, I believe it's sometime the beginning of August that we have to give them the listing by. Stephanie, I, I, but it's the same process for moving something from a lien to the property tax as it is for moving it just from a past due bill to the property tax. Is that not the case? Correct. Yes. For, for okay. that aspect of moving it from a lien to the property okay. tax, or if we hadn't even gone that process to the property tax, correct. That right. would be the same okay. process. So, so basically what I'm hearing is that even if something's on a lien and it's expiring, we're going to reissue uh, the lien. At some point in the future, we'll move it from the lien to the property tax. Uh, I'm assuming that this is not a permanent uh, rec um, this is not a recommendation for a permanent change. It's it's only uh, temporary, obviously. And um, the 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 fact is, moving something to a property tax. Um, uh, I, well, I, where they're going to pay interest either way, whether it's a lien or a property tax. But the property tax is a um, uh, typically a higher interest and it starts in uh, place the a, a process where ultimately someone could lose their property uh, we don't hopefully this isn't going to last that long but I, I'm perfectly comfortable with your uh, recommendations because of all that and um, I think we can pick this up again later the only other thing I might suggest is that uh, for anybody that is um, Past due. I don't know if we can just automatically do a 12-month uh, payment plan for them or if they have to request it, but if we can figure out a way to further help the people that, that wind up being past due by just sort of spreading that payment out, I would be in favor of 
looking at that for some future uh, motion. And then just so that everyone's clear, because I know Lois is bringing up, but this would be the first time that the district is doing the property tax avenue, which is the only reason why we're suggesting delaying it is to you know be moving a hundred thousand dollars or so of you know long past due onto the property tax roll for the first time during what's going on. That was kind of the reason why we suggested maybe we delay this process until next year. Sounds like a sensitive approach. Any other uh, comments from board members? Thoughts? Okay, uh, go out to the uh, public comments now. Any, uh, anyone in the public have a comment about this? No, yes. Um, Beth? You're on mute, Beth. Yes, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I it sounds I I've really appreciated how the district has responded. I've gotten the emails and I felt like the communications were really wonderful to uh, members of the community and gave some you know great information and a sense of peace a little for people who I know will need it. Um, I also think that whatever the decision is made uh, to take these measures. Uh, it would be great if there was some kind of communication, and I don't know if it should be a general communication, but some kind of communi communication to people to, as to what those measures mean and how they'll be carried out, at least so that people understand that it's not uh, a penalty situation, but that it's more of how to carry that debt until people are better able to manage it. Good suggestion. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Mr. Mosier. And you're on mute still. Jim, you're on mute. Is, do we take them off mute or does somebody else do that? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I was just saying I appreciated the board and staff's attention to this and taking a leadership role uh, in the region to help people get through this. Um, I think it was, uh, um, it just really uh, speaks well for the district. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? No. Okay, great. Let's go back to the uh, to the board then. So uh, it sounds like everybody's, for the most part, in favor of accepting the staff's recommendation and uh, adding to it. Uh, I think it was a good suggestion to communicate this change uh, by posting it to the website and or press release or some sort of announcement to the Valley Press. I don't know. Maybe we don't want to advertise it. Somebody help. Me on that. Uh, to the extent that we, yeah, that, that we need to communicate the policies, we should probably should, at a minimum, put it on the website. But uh, so then, uh, do we need a motion on this or just direction? I would think so. Uh, well, this is this is district council. I would um, suggest a motion for these newest measures um i would recommend against posting about them on the district's website these are mostly background collection activities um that occur when accounts are long past due and i you know there's various ways to do it but this may create more confusion than clarification yeah. to get into this information yeah good point thank you gina okay we'll make a uh I'll make a motion then that we uh, direct staff to uh, follow their own recommendation, which is to temporarily uh, suspend reporting past due accounts to credit agencies 
delay efforts to initiate collecting past due balances via the property tax roll, which had been planned to start in 2020 until 2021, and to continue to use liens to secure debt owed to the district. Can I get a second? I'll second that, Rick Moran. I'll second that. Thank you very much. Holly, you'd like to call the roll? Director Ferris. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Director Fulz. Yes. Director Fulz. Uh, Director you Henry. Hear, hopefully you can hear me, I said yes. Director Henry. Director Henry is muted. I'm muted. Yes. One more time. Director Henry. Yes. You can't hear me. Director Moran. Yes. Did you get everybody? Director Moran, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And I said yes. I said yes. Can you hear me, Holly? Yeah, yeah, we got it. Yes. We're all good. Thank you. Okay. Next new item. Can this is a uh, district council. Could I just get the vote read back on that item? Because it, it, with the process was a little bit hard to follow. Holly, uh, the district council asked to read the vote back. Director Ferris voted yes. President Swan voted yes. Director Pulse voted yes. Director Henry voted yes. Director Moran voted yes. Great, thanks. We ready to move on? Yes. Item uh, 6B is professional service contract for the swim tank, Red Rock Park tank, uh, CEQA. Uh, we have uh, the uh, environmental planner to present this item. Carly? Yes, so um, in an effort to accelerate the CEQA for the Redwood Park tank project, um, we put an informal bid out to some consultants we've worked with in the past. Um, we received two proposals back, one from Rincon for $25,000 and one from Denise Duffy and Associates for $35,000. Staff recommends to go with Rincon, um, which would be the lower proposal cost. Thank you, Carly. Any uh, questions or discussion from the board? Lou? Thank you, President Swan. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to just point out that in the proposal for Incon, they are suggesting using a sub a sub consultant, which is Water Systems Consulting Inc., otherwise known as WSC. We have a long history with that particular uh, contractor, and not all of it is good. It has been contentious at times. In particular, one of the people that they're proposing using on the project is Kristen Palenka. Um, I just wanna make sure everybody's aware that they are using that subcontractor and wanna ask the full rest of the board whether or not they have an issue with that. I do not, I, as a board member, I do not have an issue with them as a subcontractor. Okay. Uh, does anybody else on the board have an issue with uh... WSC, I was surprised to see that they were a, a subcontractor of Rincon, and I see that Rincon shows up again in the next uh, proposal. Bob, got a comment? Yeah, you know, generally speaking, I wouldn't want to hire WSC directly, um, but having said that, I, I, I don't believe that there's any issue with the uh, professional nature of the work product. Um, and so, um, 
uh, for this project, I, I, I think we're fine. It could be the changed economic circumstances are perhaps changing some of the dynamics in the uh, uh, consultant field. Uh, hopefully we'll see some lower prices here going forward. Thanks, Bob. Rick? Uh, yes, so uh, I don't know uh, particular issues with uh, the WCM, WSM, um, mm -hmm. but um, what I was uh, glad to see is that Rincon had done some previous work on the swim tanks. So they it seems to me they have some familiarity with um, the issue, all right? And uh, they did the NEPA work in 2018, I believe. Um, so they anticipate uh, the potential impacts to be less than significant. Uh, I, I, you know, I, um, I'm leery of people anticipating things. So I'm, you know, I, I, Rick has talked about this before it, it, that it's a pretty clean uh, operation up there. So I, I don't anticipate that either. But I'm just leery of using the word anticipate potential impacts. Um, and they'll use existing maps and models. Are there existing maps and models? That's to Rick. Rick I, I, I do believe that they're going to, to use the different from the first original CEQA. And we do have some existing mapping and surveying work. Okay. And do uh, you have, I know Carly talked about expediting this. Are there dates for start and finish? I don't believe we have those at this time. We were waiting for the board to approve the purchase agreement okay. and we will start right away i you know i i know you all think or made a comment about wsc i don't believe wsc is is on the swim tank project i think it's the next one the uh lion tank lion tank okay. yeah i don't believe they are listed on this project thank you rick i stand corrected this is a much smaller project the lion tank project and uh, just one more thing. Uh, I like the change of the name to Redwood Park from Swim Tank. So uh, however that was done, uh, nice job. I like the name. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, any other names. Um, from any director? Comment, question? Going once, twice, okay. Open it up. You got in under the bell, Bob. I don't know. Maybe we can uh, sell the name to it. There's, you know, for us, for some amount of money. To well, we, someone that has a lot of money now. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Okay. Open it up to the public. Any comments? Uh, <clears throat> anybody in the public? No questions? Okay, back to the board. All right. Uh, <clears throat> anybody want to make a motion? Okay, I'll make a motion. Uh, I. Go ahead, Lois. Okay, I, I'll go ahead and make the motion. I'm trying to find it. Uh, the motion number. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, where is it? Anybody want to help me with that? What? Okay. So, what I, was I, I wasn't uh, expecting. Ah! No, that's okay. I, I'm dropping everything. Let me do it, Lois. We recommend, uh, I'd like to make a motion, you can second, that uh, we direct the board, uh, the, sorry, that we direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Rincon Consultants to complete CEQA and necessary environmental permitting for the Redwood Park Tank Project. I'll second it then. Okay. Thank you, Lois. Holly, do your thing. Director Ferris. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Director Fulls. Yes. 
Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Motion passes. Super duper. What's next, Rick? Uh, our next item. Our next item item is uh, item 6C, discussion and possible action related to the Lion Tank Access Road Rehabilitation Project. We should have the district engineer uh, online who will give this report. Darren? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, This is the uh, Lion Tank Access Road Rehabilitation Project. Um, As you may know, this Settlement was slow started in 2017. The winter storms uh, made some applications with FEMA in two, in uh, August of 2018. Uh, geotechnical investigation was completed. Uh, second geotechnical investigated uh, um, investigation was completed in August of 2019. Uh, earlier this year, in February of 2020, the engineering committee. Uh, discussed the line access road rehabilitation project in great detail. After much discussion, it was decided that uh, the district should retain an environmental consultant to analyze the two options that were presented in the latest geotechnical report. And so on uh, March, in early March, March 1st, 2020, uh, I put out an RFP for environmental consulting services relating to the line tank access road rehabilitation project. And uh, on April 1st, we received one proposal from Rincon Consultants Incorporated in the amount of $171,658. The uh, proposal and cost estimate was included in the staff report. So I'm here to answer any questions you have about the project. Thank you, Darren. Uh, fellow board members, anybody have any comments or questions? Another one of those uh, only one bid kind of thing, which is one of our favorite pet peeves. Uh, Rick, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for Darren. Uh, this keeps us within the FEMA application timeline. Well, the yeah, we, we, we're in a one-year extension with FEMA right now. I think it expires in uh, September of this year. And one of the requirements in working with FEMA is that you demonstrate that you're continuing on with the project, making uh, progress in uh, evaluating and permitting the ultimate uh, repair of the project. And so that's what we're doing with this RFP, is hiring the environmental consultant to do the necessary evaluations of the two proposals and move the project forward. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Bob? I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Darren, thank you very much for this. Like Steve, I'm incredibly disappointed we continue to just get one uh, bid on these things. It's it's quite astounding. Um, the uh, Just for the, for the members of the uh, audience, could you please um, just give a brief description of what the uh, outcome or deliverable is of this uh, for this one hundred and seventy one thousand um, dollars? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm operating just a little bit outside my expertise here. So if Carly could jump in periodically, but just in general terms, The RFP provides for preliminary feasibility analysis and coordination with resource agencies, environmental review and permitting, review of construction documents, and environmental oversight for construction. And so basically what that does is uh, clear the decks so that the next step would be actual um, moving to actual construction design and then to construction? So... What, what we're doing with this RFP is retaining a environmental consultant through the entire process. So initially, they'll do an evaluation of the proposals, the, the two options that were set forth by the um, geotechnical firm. At some point, when we sort of vet those issues, 
and we come to a preferred alternative, then we would hire a design consultant. Mm -hmm. the, the, this environmental uh, group would work in hand in hand with the design consultant to um, meet the requirements of the resource agencies and incorporate all the permitting requirements into the plans and the specifications. And then they would be on board to uh, watch that project and sort of monitor that project through construction. This is a multi. This is a multi-year contract with the environmental consultant. I was going to say that sounds like it goes beyond September. So we will be able to get an extension with this kind of thing. It's it's my understanding that as long as we're making good progress in in moving the project forward, that FEMA will continue to provide us with um, extensions. But uh, I, I don't have a tremendously large number of uh, project experience with FEMA. So perhaps Rick could jump in here and, okay. and give me well, that, uh, a little help okay. with his thoughts on this particular project. No, oh, Darren, that's okay. I mean, I just wanted to make, again, this is a lot for the audience too. I mean, I, just for the rest of the board, you know, this, this sort of project would probably consume one whole year's margin on our uh, operating revenues and perhaps more. So, um, you know, th this is one of those things that will need to be talked about as we decide what to do with our operating cash. Thank you. Yeah, just to, just to put things into perspective for, for everyone involved, the cost estimates that came out of the um, geotechnical consultants evaluation are in the in the range of 12 to 15 million. So, you know, if it was a, you know, $1 million project, you know, this may, may appear to be a fairly large fee, but when you get into the order of magnitude, 12 to 15 million, um, there's obviously a lot of work that's involved there. And, and um, it's, it's a, it's a tricky site and an environmentally sensitive site. Thank you, Darren. Uh, let's go to Lois. You have a comment or question? Uh, yeah. Am I, can you hear me? Okay. So here's find a microphone. A, a photo of that site because it's mind boggling to see it. And it, it'd be easier to understand why it's going to cost so much. <clears throat> so, um, I, Okay, Lou brought up WSC. I have a real issue with WSC, but it, it, they aren't doing, what happened in the past, I'm sorry, but what happened in the past, the former district manager would just go to WSC, not put it out for bid and say, I know these people, they do a good job. And I think we paid a premium because of that. Um, so they aren't, I mean, granted, we didn't get any other bid here, but at least it went out to bid. And WSC isn't actually in charge. So otherwise, I... I would have a big issue if they were in charge of this project. That's it. Thanks, Lois. Rick, your hand is up. Your hand is down. You got a comment? No? No, Another? I did not. I, oh. I made all the comment I need. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, nobody else. Let's go out to the uh, the fan club. We we still have fourteen attendees. Any comments or uh, from the uh, public? <clears throat> One from Gail. You are recognized. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I am on the engineering committee, and I just thought I would add in part an explanation that um, 
the reason that this needs to be approved soon is that the results of the environmental consultants will in many ways um, determine how we move forward. So in other words, they may determine that one of these alternatives is just going to be so uh, environmentally problematic that we wouldn't want to pursue it. And so it actually kind of helps us forestall a situation where we go and design a project that then turns out to be so difficult to get through all the uh, state and other agencies uh, that it wouldn't be a very good use of people's time. That's all. Great. Thank you, Gail. Okay, we're back to the uh, the board action, and uh, so so we we'll follow the. I'm going to suggest then that we follow the recommend. I'll make a motion that we uh, uh, award the environmental consultant contract for the Lion Tank Access Road Rehabilitation Project to Rincon. Consultants and direct the district manager to enter into an agreement, which was left off my notes. I will second that motion. Thank you very much. Holly, do the dirty. Director Ferris? Aye. President Swan? Yes. Director Coles? Yes. Director Henry? You're muted, Lois. You're on mute, Lois. Kick the dog. <laughs> Jeez. I can't even hear Holly. It's I'm saying Director Henry. Okay, yes. Okay. Director Thanks, Moran. Yes. Motion passes. Super duper again. Back to you, Rick. Bring us home. Okay. Sitting there. Okay. Uh, and the B is the Low Income Assistance Group Program. Uh, I recommend that the board of directors review this memo. And the um, I can't hear. Uh, it's, too, it's very quiet. Can you hear? Uh, you were very, very uh, low before. Let's try it again. Okay, yeah, this better, is better. item uh, 6D, low income assistant rate program. program. Recommended that the board of directors review this uh, memo and the attached correspondence from the friends of the San Lorenzo Valley uh, Water, uh, requesting that the board consider establishing a low income assistance rate program. Um, staff and the board members have been working with the uh, friends of the San Lorenzo Valley Water. Uh, this is a local citizens group whose mission is to ensure that all citizens of our valley have access to safe, safe, affordable water, which they recognize as a fundamental human right. And to fulfill this mission, the Friends support programs and policies that protect and restore the San Lorenzo Valley watershed, waterways, and aquifers, repair and maintain uh, the district's uh, infrastructure, and recognize that costs should be distributed in a manner that protects uh, with limits and financial resources. Um, they have submitted a, a low income assistant rate program for the board to review. Um, and it's shown uh, that the, they recommend that the board adopt a resolution expressing the intent of the district to implement a low income rate assistance program as soon as feasible and instruct staff to uh, conduct necessary research and have staff report back to the board on the program, implementation options and costs. Um, uh, they're looking at a, a possible assuming a minimum discount of $10 a month or a maximum of $20 a month with an annual cost to the district would range between $100,000 uh, and $360,000 a year. Um, it's recommended that we uh, move this uh, item or uh, have a short discussion about this item and talk about ways that we could move this item ahead and consider and discuss considering the possible amount of discussion. Staff feels it deserves multiple meetings and recommends that the special board of directors meeting or finance committee meeting be scheduled to discuss uh, their proposal 
or other options that the board feels, feels desirable. And with that, um, um, uh, some of the representatives of, uh, of Flow, uh, I do believe are on the call tonight or on the on meeting tonight, uh, Jim Mosier for sure. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you. Here. Thank you, Rick. Uh, now, this is a topic and a discussion item that can take a lot of time to uh, master, and I don't want to stay here all night. And I'm going to suggest that uh, uh, we'll let a representative from this organization uh, present it. Uh, Rick did an admirable job, and I'm sure we've all read uh, our due diligence with the documentation provided. And uh, I'd like to give the opportunity to the, the proposing group to uh, propose it directly to the board as well. And then the board can have a bit of a discussion and decide what we want to do. Uh, but I got to tell you, I'm already in favor of, of uh, scheduling a special board meeting to discuss this because this could be a very involved and long uh, topic for discussion, and I don't want to, we're not going to do it tonight. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm coming from, but in, in that vein, I'd like to turn it over to uh, one of the, uh, the representatives and then let the board have a normal comment, if that's okay with you guys. So uh, who wants to present this or represent this for the, uh, for the attendees? Is that you, Elaine? We'll recognize you, Elaine, you're the only hand up that I see. You can hear me now, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I think it's a pretty easy presentation of what we're proposing. We, we know that the number of you have been concerned about how the low-income uh, rate payers can, af can afford uh, the rates, especially if there's a rate increase. And what we did is we uh, researched a number of other water boards in California and um, saw what they were doing successfully and came up with a program that we think would be helpful to our district. And basically it's uh, at giving low income people a discount, either $10 or $20 a month, whatever you folks think is feasible. Um, and the eligibility would be based on PG&E's care program which is already established in which other LIRA programs, LIRA standing for low income rate assistance, use to, um, to uh, uh, establish the eligibility of people. So they, they give discounts to rate payers who have incomes 200% of poverty guidelines. And the application would be really simple. They would just need to uh, give a form with a copy of their PG&E bill. And now we know that funding cannot happen through because of uh, through the income that comes from uh, water delivery. So because of Prop 218, but we think that funding could be could come from property taxes or interest income. And what we're thinking is that this is a better solution than not than foregoing the rate increase because it would give more money to people who are low income. And the rate, if you, it, 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 the rate increase will only amount to about two to $4 a month. Uh, this discount could be anywhere from a minimum $10 to $20. So we're thinking you could cap the program, maybe cap it at 100,000. I mean, that would be something you could decide on and that could help at least 800 people based on uh, uh, the numbers that we were given from Stephanie. Um, the cost to the district, if there is no rate increase, would be uh, about 325, 326,000 for this year and over 500,000 a year annually afterwards. So we feel that this program is helping low income people more, but also not depriving the district of needed funds for all of the projects that you have and for all the maintenance that's required. So we think this is a viable solution. 
And um, we, we hope that you will resolve to discuss it further and, and uh, decide on the specifics and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. I think you did a good job of summarizing the uh, memorandum that you put together and uh, your numbers are okay. So, uh, you know, in looking at this, if it's 800 people out of 7,900 connections, that's 11% of our customer base, basically. Uh, it's a lot of money, even 100,000, but I'm also keenly in favor of doing whatever we can to help uh, where we can. You know, I've looked at, at a lot of the other uh, examples that are in the table and back Calaveras County water is the one that I looked at first. And uh, I'm trying to go through these and find a, a water district of similar size and, and nature as our own. Calaveras is like twice the, uh, twice the customers that we have. They have 13,000 connections and they also have their own hydroelectric plant as well. So they're got a lot going on for them. So I'd like to spend some time doing some additional research on these other examples and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and then, and then working with the other directors to come up with something. But that was sort of my thought as, as this, but let's open it up to director comment at this point. Lou, you are recognized with your blue paw. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the friends of Santa Rosa Valley Water for putting together what is a very comprehensive proposal. Um, initially, uh, number one, Three comments. Number one is I support this program. I think it's an important part of, of helping the ratepayers in a very financially stressful time. Uh, number two, I agree that there should be a backstop of between fifty and one hundred thousand dollars as a as a modest funding of this and and seeing how it goes. Uh, but number three, I do not think we should. Um, preclude a rate increase change uh, by doing this. I think we should not link those two. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Any other uh, comments? Bob? Bob, you're recognized. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, just to uh, have a quick preface in this. Um, hopefully this is this kind of web conferencing is something that we can do even going into the future after the uh, lockdown. And um, I really appreciate the attendees hanging around as long as they did. Another innovation, of course, would be to either tweet out or post on Facebook when we're getting to particular agenda items so people can join if they didn't want to listen to the entire thing. Um, you know, with, with situations like this, I, I think we uh, need to have the conversation about um, uh, the entire sort of scope of funding issues that face this district, many of which have been have built up over the decades, um, and so that we really can start looking at where we're going to be assigning uh, money, um, and whether that's relief for all ratepayers or relief for some ratepayers, uh, pension uh, funding tank maintenance, whatever, these are all coming out of basically the margin dollars that we uh, achieve um, between our, our water revenue and our expenses. And so, uh, you know, the choices that you face in that, of course, are either taking lower margin, which means we don't have as much money for the other projects we have, finding ways to cut costs in order to uh, <laughs> offset the uh, re revenue reduction, uh, or, in effect, shifting the costs from uh, certain rate payers to other rate payers. So, in, in other words, uh, other rate payers will effectively pay more in order to achieve the same margin targets that we need to uh, handle all of the unfunded liabilities that have been built up over the decades. So, uh, these are the kinds of things that I think are um, uh, need to go into the conversation. We definitely need to have a conversation. Um, and, I, and I believe that we need to uh, ask staff to bring to that conversation a complete rundown on all of the uh, unfunded and underfunded liabilities that we have, including those that we haven't quite received calculations for, 
so that we can have that conversation in a clear, transparent fashion for the community so the community can understand what the priorities are in terms of allocating uh, these kinds of funds. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to getting that scheduled as quickly as possible. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Lois, your hand is uh, next up on my list here. You'll have to unmute yourself. There you go. Lois disappeared. Okay, Rick, you're up. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, this uh, type of program is definitely appropriate at this time. So uh, I really appreciate people taking the effort to put this forward here. Um, and I think the district can do something proportional to the, its size. Um, so it's a, you know, appropriate and we can afford to do something. Um, and I know that the state legislature has worked on, um, program like this and, um, it would be, uh, interesting for me if Mark Stone, um, or, uh, one member of his staff could be around when we do have such a meeting. All right. And I uh, support your proposal, Bob, I mean, Steve, to have a special board meeting. And um, one of the things I heard earlier is, uh, I think uh, somebody mentioned about uh, if we're gonna have uh, committee meetings. Well, um, if we do, then the financial committee should, uh, you know, this could be something that could be put on their agenda as well. So um, I support this uh, process. And um, I do agree with you, Steve, that uh, it needs a fuller explanation and a fuller look at uh, at a special board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Lois, I see you're back uh, with, uh, with us. I'm back in town. Yeah, you're up. Okay. Well, a couple of things. I have contacted Mark Stone's office a couple of times about the Assembly Bill 401. It's never been uh, financed. And I'm asking, I, and they finally gave me the name of someone else to contact. Um, and, and I did that, but I haven't heard anything. And my question is, are they gonna, is the state gonna finance Assembly Bill 401? Um, so far, no, re, no response. Um, Okay, I think that there are ways to help uh, low-income people, and I uh, agree with this. I have a little problem with a hundred thousand because over ten years that'd be a million dollars. On the other hand, I think we ought to apply some money to this. And I'm not trying to be a cheapskate here, but I was thinking if we did 60,000, and I, I, if I remember when I was doing my numbers, that would be um, $5 for 1,200 people a month. That doesn't seem like much, but that would totally wipe out the rate increase for people who are probably low income. It's uh, one, if they use one unit, two units, three units, or up to four units of water, because the rate increase is $1.60 a month, just the flat fee, and it's 58 cents a unit. So that $5 would get rid of like 450 or for whatever it is. So up to um, people using four units. I believe we need the rate increase. I mean, Bob keeps going on about we have all these unfunded liabilities. Why would we not? go ahead with our rate increase. If we have all these unfunded liabilities, plus we have a lot of things happening right now. We got 
things. We're spending money now on fire management, on um, reaching out to people, outreach. Uh, we're working on a number of things that need money. And I don't think we can do a flat budget. Wouldn't that be great? I would love it. But just looking at the interest expense, it's gone up 81% because of, of the loan. So, and we have a number of things that, are, that have just come up that are one-time items. I'm not going to go over that because we talked about it last month. So I think we should do something, but maybe we need to start out smaller and see what we can really afford to do. Um, because let's face it, I, I, I'm, I've said before, my cousin's on a water board in Southern California. They pay, they pay very little for their water bill, but they have so many more hookups than we do. And unless you're taking a look at how many hookups these people have virtual, uh, versus what we have, you don't really know how it's affecting their water district compared to how it would affect, affect ours. Jeez, I'm waving my hands around. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's what I, I was thinking just and I don't think anybody likes my $5 a month routine, but for people who use one or two units a month, it actually gives them extra money um, because it gets rid of the, if we, when we do the rate increase this year and it'll get rid of the one that was done last year. So anyway, that's, that's where I am. I think okay, okay, I the water district needed yeah. this rate increase. Right. Okay, Rick, your hand is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Bob, your hand, uh, you haven't been heard yet. Please uh, come in. Well, I think I have been heard. This would be my second if uh, so, uh, but if that's okay, I just have a couple of quick points. Um, I think as part of this process, we also need to take a look at our revenue distribution. Uh, that is how many people are in uh, the lower end of the usage spectrum, um, it's actually rather illuminating and, and a little bit scary um, to see that because uh, we have a small number of customers that account for a, a large percentage of our revenue. Um, in addition to that, um, just to be clear, uh, I am for, if, if what the board is going to do is continue what I view as a status quo approach to budgeting year by year, uh, not really making any fundamental changes in uh, uh, operating costs and that sort of thing, then I don't uh, support the rate increase because it continues to give our community, in my opinion, a skewed view of how things are here. We are not in a status quo situation. Um, I am perfectly willing to have a large conversation about what our total unfunded liabilities are, the promises that we've made to our uh, employees, which are solemn promises, the need to not kick the can down the road to the next generation for promises that we've made. Um, and the only way we're going to do that is if we look at things in a totality with all the items on the table over a multi-year approach. If we have that kind of conversation, that gives us the foundation to go back to the community and start having a real uh, conversation about where this district is uh, and how we got here over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, if we're not gonna have that conversation, then from my point of view, it, the only thing we really can do is optimize year to year with flat budgets <laughs> and uh, no rate increases until such time as we decide to have that conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Rick, you had your hand up. Rick, did your hand, is your hand up or did you just never put it down? I probably never put it down, uh, but I'm fine. Unless it was Rick Rogers. 
No, we we still have uh, Mr. Mosier on the attendees that had oh. had his hand up for some time. Oh, okay. I didn't notice that over there. Sorry, I thought we'd done that. Let's. Uh, oh, okay. So, with Lou, you have a comment, Lou? Yes, real quickly. I just want two points. Number one, I agree with what Bob had to say, and I think we need to have that discussion. And number two, I'd like to point out that I believe there's a potential for benefit to the district as well as the low income ratepayers by implementing a LIRA program. I'm referring to the fact that we have a, a cadre of a few hundred habitual ratepayers that go through this vicious cycle of, of not paying their bill until the water is turned off, paying the bill suddenly somehow having the water turn back on again, and then we continue that vicious cycle three months down the road. And that that involves a lot of the district's time to get, the person has to go out to turn the water off and go back out to turn it back on again. So there is some real savings if we can avoid, if we can take some of these people and move them out of that category of habitual turn off, turn on, um, we will be saving money as well. So I think there's a, there's a dual benefit here potentially. Right. Thank you, Lou. Uh, as I had mentioned when we started this, uh, this is proving to be, and obviously it's going to be a very large uh, scoped, it's becoming even larger in scope than uh, originally identified. And I think all of those uh, comments uh, that we've heard uh, uh, bear to be looked at in great detail and discussed and bringing in as many people as we can to also participate in this. Uh, and Lois is, Lois is close association with uh, Mark Stone. Maybe she can find something more out of them on what the state may or may not do. But at any rate, that's where I think we're going to end up going to that, uh, to have a, a, a special board meeting or two to deal with this matter in great detail and come up with a program that I think, well, ideally we would come up with something that would be both beneficial and implementable uh, and, and practical. But uh, let's go back. We have uh, some hands coming up from the uh, attendees now. I must have overlooked someone. We'll give them an opportunity to comment. Oh, half the half the people have their hands up. Okay, let's start with you, Jim. Thank you. I thank the board for uh, considering this proposal and um, hope uh, hope that we can move forward in a positive way. I wanted to clarify that the Friends of San, San Lorenzo Valley Water is a new group um, and that um, some of us were involved with uh, flow and uh, getting uh, taking on CalAM and some of us were involved in uh, uh, Felton Library Friends, but uh, those two are separate groups that uh, this is a new group with a new mission. So I, I just wanted to clarify that so that there's no misunderstanding about who we are. Um, and I just also want to um, uh, encourage the board to move on this relatively quickly because uh, I think this the timing would, would really be important around the here with the, the state of the economy and the, and the needs of the low income folks in our valley. Um, so I, I encourage you to uh, and appreciate that you're thinking about having a special meeting on it and our group would very much like to work with you on it as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> let's see who's next. Well, we have a phone number as next, so I'll stick with people that have names. So let's go with uh, Beth. Hi, this is Beth. Um, I wanted to say that I appreciate also looking for ways to mitigate some of the impact that's been over the last few years on people in the community who do not have the ability to pay for the rate increases. Um, one of the things that occurred to me as Lois was speaking was that I think we can't assume that low income people are people who are low water users and $5 a month might not have meaning to their bills. Um, but I think it's really important to look at the issue and look at, look at the different possibilities for how those needs could be addressed. Another thing that occurs to me is that 
I'm not sure it's the timing is so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't feel like there's necessarily a rush at this point because I believe what's going to happen is because of the uh, measures that the district is taking to help people who are having trouble paying in the current economic situation, that some of that will be taken care of. And I think it's probably a really important thing to find a more ongoing way of dealing with this uh, that really does not um, impact the district in a, a really negative way financially, but is also able to address some of those needs. All right, thanks. Thank you, Beth. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Peter. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, great. It's Peter Gelblum. I assume that's who you were calling on. Um, I, I wanted to address uh, Lou's point about the rate increase and the uh, Lira program not being necessarily tied together. Um, I mean, I, people need relief for their bills anyway, but definitely one of the, and I'm a member of the, of the Friends group, one of the um, things that was the genesis for uh, Lira, the Lira proposal, was the fact that that I, I think, um, although I, I'm not sure that Bob agrees, but it, it seems to me pretty indisputable that the rate increase is necessary for all the reasons that Lois mentioned about the unfunded liabilities, and she didn't even mention infrastructure. Uh, so that's in there. Uh, the district needs money. Things. You know, things just are getting more expensive everywhere. Water is more expensive, and it's not going to get cheaper. It's going to keep getting more expensive. And so uh, I'm assuming that the rate increase is absolutely essential. It has to happen. And one way to mitigate that is the Lira program. The Lira program would be important whether or not the rate increase goes into, into, into effect, but uh, it's particularly important uh, offset offset the the increase in expense for what I view and I think a lot of people view as an absolutely essential uh, increase to pay for all the things the district needs to pay for. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so uh, just to, just to make a point, you know the, the the board is in agreement that a we want to do something and and we need to or. or probably going to schedule special meetings for this to discuss it. Uh, so the remaining people with their hands up, you don't need to lobby for this uh, at this point because we're already convinced we'd like to do something. So just to say that, uh, to save uh, in the essence of time, we we'll recognize Gail again. Yes, thank you. I, I would just encourage uh, when we think about this, to not leave any money on the table uh, when we talk about rate increases in the sense that um, while we want to protect the people that have low incomes, we also have people here that can afford a rate increase and to not have a rate increase uh, would be silly because you'd just be leaving money on the table um, in addition to the point that we need it all. So I would hope that we would approach this as something that could be revenue neutral. In other words, um, we would make the program the size that it needs to be to serve that 10 or 15% of the population that needs it. And we would offset that by a rate increase, perhaps even bigger than the one that was already budgeted. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gail. We have a telephone number that we should recognize. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting to that. They're, they're, they're the last on the list because I don't have a name. Yeah, we're going to recognize. I heard that I'm unmuted. Uh, yeah, whoever you are. Mr. Yes. Guest, sign in. We'll try and guess your occupation. 20 questions. 20 questions. Okay, I, uh, it's Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Bruce, uh, it had to be you. Thanks for calling, thanks for calling in. in. When, I well, your, your, I finally figured it out. Uh, it's a lot of echo going on. So um, when, we, when we worked on water rates in the past, 
Well, well, let me say um, there was a time when the district had five different uh, rates. It had uh, tiered rates with five different rates. And the one that paid the highest rate was the school district. Um, and, and so over time, we, we managed to simplify the rate structure so that there's only one rate at this point. Um, so to go back to a, another system where there's tiered rates, um, to me is a step in the wrong direction, a step backwards. Um, also, please, please think, you know, what, do we, do we want to go back to having the school district pay the higher, higher rate? I guess it, it, the proposal would be to have two rates, but then the school district would pay the higher of the two rates. Is, is that a good way to go? Um, so somehow I think I'd like to see it as a rebate rather than a different rate. And, and I, I'd like to see the rebate only apply to the basic rate, um, not the water rate. I think we did well to put a high price on water because it promotes conservation. And it's also a way that lower income people can, can essentially fight back because they can, they can conserve more. They can reduce their consumption if they want to reduce their water rate with their water bill. So there is a way to adapt by using less water. Um, so if there's a way to only apply this to the basic rate, which I, as I recall is around $30 a month, um, then I would, I would favor doing it that way and having, continuing to have one, uh, one rate for water, for, for volume, you know, water by volume. Um, AB 401, there was a report issued in February and it's kind of a lengthy report. I would have forwarded it to you, but it's a lot to read. Um, one of the things that's said in there is that as far as the human rights aspect, it's, it, it, it's too much for any one district. Uh, there's some districts in the state that where, where most of their customers need some kind of assistance. And so, uh, the district can't do it on their own. Um, maybe ours is in the middle and maybe we could do it on our own. But, um, anyway, there is a lot to absorb if you want to learn about what, what they found from AB 401. Um, Scotts Valley apparently approved a, a program like this about a year ago, and they're a similar size district, you know, right in our neighborhood. So I think Scotts Valley would be the easiest one to look at for, to compare. Um, let's see. With, with respect to what, uh, director Ferris said about the shutoffs you could run a pilot program and just target, uh, you know, pick some number of, of these cases that you're concerned about and just target them and, and try them and, you know, offer them uh, some kind of a, offer them a program and see, see if it would make any difference. Um, and I, I guess I also think uh, I'd, I'd be sorry to see you run out of money, you know, start a program partway through the year and then, exhaust the amount of money. So somehow you've got to scope this, I think, so that you can at least do a 12 month period and, and, and see how it goes. Right. Thank you, Bruce. I'm afraid the time is up and we're going to move on. Okay, there, will be, there will be, thank you. Uh, and uh, oh, there's another Sindizen. Sindizen. You are recognized. Hi, this is Cynthia Zenzel. Um, I want to respond to a couple of things that Bruce said. I believe that we have to help people stay in their homes, but if we don't ask those who can afford it, no one will have the water system we all need. So it can't be a, a targeted program we have to rely on people applying for the program themselves. Is that correct, Gina? Uh, first of all, no program has been adopted yet. So the, we're all just still sort of discussing it. That's part of the proposal in the memorandum that the uh, former flow folks, whatever the new acronym is, proposed. Friends of San Lorenzo Valley Water. Right. Okay, the people that qualify still have to apply. 
it's not up to the district to say, we want to tell that family over there, we're going to give them a break, right? No, we don't it's, know what we're going to do. Nothing has been decided yet. All we have is a proposal from this group. Right. But I just heard Bruce Holloway say that he thinks the district should choose a few people and target them. Uh, Bruce is just uh, commenting as a as a you know citizen. He's not speaking on behalf of the district or any of the. I, I'm just. Policy I'm just makers. speaking to the idea that this has to be fair and open to anyone who qualifies, rather than the district choosing winners and losers. Which I'm asking Gina, as I understand, that was a problem in other ways of doing this. Um, also, I believe Scotts Valley only has one person who's participating in their low income ratepayer program because they don't have a lot of low income ratepayers. Thank you. Thank you for considering this. I think it's really important. And I think the people that can pay want to pay in order to have a district that functions well. Thank you very much. Okay, back to the uh, board for any final uh, comments. Uh, anybody has any? I'd like to propose that we and suggest rather that we that we direct staff to and direct a separate special board of directors meeting to discuss this in greater detail, uh, taking into consideration all aspects and a larger in, increase the scope of this as well to increase uh, a better understanding. As Bob keeps pointing out, to uh, with respect to unfunded liabilities, et cetera. So I'd like to uh, schedule a meeting at the most next most convenient time when the staff can prepare some materials uh, that are being asked for, as well as provide enough notice for the public to participate in this as well, whether in person or in uh, this virtual world that we seem to be in. So is that enough uh, direction with respect to that? Well, it's, it, it, do it's what it, it, it would be what information that you want to have at that meeting. It would depend on it. Okay, specifically getting a handle around the unfunded mandates and the other items that Bob was talking about. That's going to take some time. We don't um, have that information yeah. available at this point. Rick, Rick I, I think if, if I can break in here. We'll probably uh, have multiple meetings to address this because of the interest Steve. and the passion. Yeah, Director Fultz is trying to ask a question. Uh, uh, Steve, I, I, I can, uh, I think I, if I can have a conversation with Rick tomorrow morning, I'll, uh, I, I think we can actually do something faster perhaps than he might be uh, might be thinking. I would, prefer, I would prefer the direction come from the full board and not from a single board member. Because I, I, Bob's length will be lengthy and we will not be able to have the time to get all that information together. I, I think Rick, if you would, okay. if you would to uh, uh, have that conversation with me, you'd find it'd be a lot faster than you think. I'm sorry, Bob. I, I'm, I'm bouncing between muting everybody and hearing you. So, what did you, you say? Yeah, sorry about that. So, um, I believe that there is a way that we can uh, come up with some um, what I'd call back of the envelope estimates for some of these unfunded liabilities pretty quickly. I think we have good numbers for a lot of them. I think there's only a couple that we may have to uh, take a swag at. But I believe that this can be done actually very quickly, and I'd be happy to share what I have with uh, a direct, uh, with General Manager Rogers uh, here very shortly. I disagree. We can move in that direction. That's the board's desire. Okay. I, I don't know how we have the conversation without understanding everything that's in front of us and how we're going to allocate money. We've, we've been at this now for 
16 months and um, on a couple of key items, we're no closer than we were 16 months ago. Well, maybe on a couple of key items, Bob, but I think we've made substantial progress in the last 15, we 16 off months. Topic? Well, I think it's about what we're going to ask the staff to bring back, and that is on topic. I mean, look, if, uh, if, if I, I think it's one of those things where one way or the other, these topics are going to be introduced into the conversation. Uh, let's see. How about how do we do this? How about if I and you come up with that? And I take Bob's input. Bob creates a, a draft summary of what he what he thinks he's missing, what we're looking for, and then I, and then I can sit down and review. It's no, I have, I have no problem giving information. It's just the level of information that Bob wants is extremely time consuming from staff. I mean, I have no problem getting this information, but he his level of information requests are very extremely lengthy. If you would just hear me out, you would see that is in fact not the case. That is a conversation that we need to have. And, uh, can Rick Moran pop in here? Yeah, just go ahead. So I, I think what I'm hearing you say, Steve, is that there may be multiple meetings that have to happen. And I think the most important thing is here, uh, is we consider the Lira program first, and then uh, the questions that Bob has that may require more staff time or a deeper understanding can be part of a second board meeting that it deals with this issue. But we should get on to the specifics of a uh, helping low-income people first, uh, and with the knowledge that uh, Bob's issues and the issues of unfunded liabilities are going to be part of this discussion, but they don't have to all happen at the same time. We can have this uh, first part be the Lira discussion at one meeting. That's my comment, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that, Rick. I, and I don't wanna kick the can down the road uh, anymore or any further, Bob, either. So don't think that we're you know looking at doing that. I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to mechanically get, uh, get what you're looking for. I appreciate Rick, that, thank you. Yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead. If we can do this, if we can, with respect to this uh, objective, which is to provide some sort of relief for, you know, uh, low-income individuals, and schedule a meeting to address that and all of the material they've presented and the research that I'd started on it and can complete in a reasonable time. If we could have a schedule special board meeting, say for the thirtieth of April, that sort of time weeks from now focus board meeting it's, it's availability and people should be available seeing that we're doing it remotely so we can you know just a text brief and start working on setting up our board meeting, special board meeting Let, let's okay then let's do that and let's see what materials we can put together for that meeting that addresses this and maybe some extra as well uh, but this will be the main focus. I don't want to tell you the scope is going to be, you know, this large, right? But it'll primarily focus on on this this issue. Uh, and we'll thank Director Moran for okay. his uh, And then we'll we'll deal with the rest. Hopefully, some somehow between now and then, to some extent, or to the extent possible. Uh, okay, so is everybody cool with that? Oh, Lou, yeah, you had a comment? Yeah, Question? I would suggest Com since you mentioned a specific date of April 30th, I would propose that we move that out beyond May 5th because I believe that's the expiration date of the shelter in place executive order from the governor. So if, if we go beyond that date, it's possible that we can have a face to face meeting, which I think we desperately need. To, to truly get somewhere in talking about the subject. That's, I'm good with that. I'm good with May 7th. That's the, the following Thursday. We can set that as a target and let Holly do the coordination and uh, she can harass us to return her emails and phone calls. 
<laughs> I'm fine with May 7th. This is Rick Moran. Thank you, Rick. Everybody else uh, good with that? Yeah, for some funny reason, my travel schedule is not uh, is not happening. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, that that should be good. I think that's the regularly scheduled board meeting anyway. So, or it would have been. Yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so let's do that. And okay, so that wraps up low income rates for tonight. We do have one more request for a public comment from Tina. Could you use this? Who's that? Tina? You got your Hi. three minutes. All right. Uh, unrelated to the uh, low income, but um, related more to your meeting timing, is that Gail Newell has said that we may extend our own shelter in place a little longer than the governor's. So just keep that in mind um, and just, you know, of course, watch for what she's giving out because it, it all depends on how we're doing in our county, right? So each sure. county can determine to, to extend it based on how well they're doing. And since we're in the Bay Area, we're a little bit more of a hotspot. So that may go a little longer here in the Bay Area. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, thank you. Julie noted. Okay, uh, what's next, Mr. District Manager? Uh, moving on, I do believe it's today's what is it? The minutes, the consent agenda. Anything any director wants pulled from the consent agenda or from the minutes of the meeting of March 19th? Seeing no blue hands, I'll assume nothing. District reports. Department status reports. I'm sorry, I'm doing your job for you, Rick. No, that's okay. You, you, have, uh, you have the department head. Should be still uh, at attending the meeting. Uh, engineering, environmental, finance, legal, and operations. Hopefully, we can answer any of your questions. Okay. Hello, directors. Uh, from Rick Moran, I have no questions. Okay, um, Bob, you see your up. Yeah, just a real quick one. Um, just for uh, uh, audience um, and other interest, uh, what's the uh, status of the Bear Creek construction, Rick, and when do we expect that'll be uh, completed? Is the uh, Director of Operations still on, James? There's no audio for James. There's no audio for James. No, uh, the water line, uh, the water line replacement is going well. We do believe tonight will be our last low closure all night work. Um, they appear to be getting done a day early on the road closures, so we'll have a uh, press release and, and update tomorrow morning if all goes as planned tonight. The water line has been installed. They're in the pressure testing and back. Uh, bacteriological testing now. Um, we're almost uh, the water line work. We're just about completed. Uh, and was that in, was that installed on the other side of the road uh, this time? That was all on the opposite side of the the inboard side of of the roadway. Yes. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Good. Good work. Any other uh, questions or comments? The department heads that are all around. Hearing none, any reports? <coughs> there are no committees, so why would there be a report, right? <laughs> At this time, uh, director's reports. Anything from a director? Well, this well, this one won't go on, so I'm going to say uh, that's it. Uh, and uh, we're, that's a wrap, right? Anybody? That's a wrap, and we should adjourn.